I think one thing I would say about alignment is I don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> In a community as crypto as a whole that needs to grow or die. I don't think this alignment narrative is particularly healthy in the long term for any projects pushing it. When you use weak security models, attackers will exploit them. A huge delta of brackish water at the estuary between the river of, of Cosmos yeah. and, the, and the sea of Ethereum. <laughs> yeah. Welcome to The Interop. Today, my guest is Jack Samplin. He's the founder at Strangelove. They're an engineering team and validator in the Cosmos ecosystem and have contributed to many projects you all know and love. Um, I'm not going to try to list them off here, but there are plenty. Uh, so today we're going to be talking about a new, um, a new project that has come out of the Strangelove team. It's called Roll Chains. You might have seen it on Twitter. And we're going to be discussing that, understanding what it is and how it fits within this, uh, it seems like, growing number of ways that people can build applications and secure them using Celestia and other forms of security. Uh, before we get started, though, make sure to subscribe and hit the like button to get notified when new episodes drop every week. And remember, none of what we discuss here on The Interrupt is investment advice or financial advice. And if you enjoy this content, you should stick with us. We're validating on Evmos, Quicksilver, Osmosis, and now on Passage. Uh, check out our passage validator if you're uh, if you're a passage holder. Just look for interop in the active set. Jack, thanks for coming back on. Strange loves strange loves over on passage too. Yop yop, let's get it. Yeah yeah <laughs> yeah. We uh, we just um, just put a ticket in passage and uh, set up a validator. So we're excited about that. Actually, we're, we're I, thinking you know, about doing a podcast in passage. Uh, we need to figure out oh. how it work technically, but uh, yeah. I love that. I, I think, you know, Lex is a fantastic founder. He's been working on this for years and really cool to see them getting a little closer to market, developing that game world and like, you know, building that, building that business. So uh, excited for Passage. Yeah. The, it, I feel like it's kind of, it's a bit of an underrated project right now. Like uh, a, a lot of people in Cosmos are talking about it, but not a lot of folks I think outside of pa Cosmos are, are familiar with it. Uh, but I feel like it's going to have its moment soon. And, um, and we're gonna see like a lot of activity there and projects building on it and like, you know, influencers um, doing content in Passage. I think there's like a huge opportunity here. Yeah, I strongly agree. I think that the blockchain gaming space in general, like, you know, if you want to monetize attention or monetize people's time, I think crypto is kind of a natural way to do that. And gamers also want ways to earn rewards. There's already all of these mechanisms within games. Why not put it on chain and make it tradable? And I think yeah. that this is a, you know, an obvious growth area. Many people have said this, and I think that it's up to the builders to make compelling games for people. A lot of the other blockchain games I've tried so far, you know, I tried out Star Atlas the other day and like, you know, the promise for Star Atlas is like build and modify a huge spaceship and put lasers on it and go fly around the world and conquer things with your friends. And like, that sounds super cool. And the state of the game right now is like a really janky 2D model with NFT ships that you can pay like $10,000 for. And like, that's just not, it's not compelling. And I, I think that, you know, what you need is immersive virtual worlds, like the stuff that Passage is building like what the Argus team is building with their world engine. And, you know, there's a couple of other kind of stealthier startups. The Saga folks also have a lot of blockchain gaming interest on their platform as well. Yeah, I, I'm so not a gamer. I mean, like, I, I have these moments where I will play games for maybe like a month and then totally get out of it. Actually, <laughs> I just bought a Nintendo Switch like oh, nice. this week. <laughs> what are you playing, <laughs> playing on it? Tetris. I'm such a boomer oh, nice. playing Tetris on the Nintendo Switch. Yo, and, and Tetris Mario is Kart. a classic. <laughs> it's pretty amazing. It's, I mean, as far as the game goes. It's, uh, it's like, I mean, but like, this is a really good platform. I mean, like, yeah. you know, just the hardware, like the fact that you can plug this on your TV and there's two remote controls like on the thing that you can... I mean, it's not super comfortable, right? The little kind of the little controllers, right? And then you can have up to eight people. It's such like a fun uh, thing to just have in your living room. And like, if people come over, oh, let's play Mario Kart, right? Like, it's just um, oh yeah, it's such a different gaming experience from like say a PS Five or something like that. But again, like, I'm not 
I'm so not a gamer, so uh, I'm just discovering. Well, uh, you can play my favorite game on Nintendo Switch. Which is what? Factorio. Check oh, it out. No, no. I just sent you a link. Yeah. Okay. It's uh, a fact. You build a factory and uh, launch a rocket. It's super oh, okay. Fun. Cool. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I, I used to, I, so I, I I sometimes played SimCity uh, when I was younger. Oh right, yeah, City, I was a big SimCity like, fan. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's I, I a like that's SimCity. a really fun one. Yeah, yeah. this is kind of similar, but better. Um. Anyway. Yeah, um, not to yeah. make this all about gaming. <laughs> Blockchain gaming. <laughs> Yeah. No, but I mean, what are you excited about these days? I mean, other than other than role chains, obviously, like what uh, kind of tickles your interest in the Cosmos space and, and beyond, of course? Yeah, you know, I think that what I am excited about is this growth in, mod in this modularity narrative. And I think that this has always been the design philosophy that Cosmos has preached, you know. The Unix design philosophy is simple, single-use components that expose an easy-to-use API and can be endlessly remixed and composed together to form higher-level systems. And I think that in the original software, ABCI sort of embodies this as far as a, an interface that allows for new things. And what we've seen is folks breaking apart the stack in new and novel ways with data availability and shared sequencing and things like that and um, building these modular tools. And, you know, part of that for me, who's been building modules in the Cosmos SDK and thinking about blockchains from a modular perspective for a very long time, it's exciting to see interest around this. And I think when you think about the two major paths to scale, one is vertical scalability, which is sort of embodied by uh, Solana, and one is horizontal scalability, which is embodied by Cosmos, you know, more and more folks jumping into that world, I think is really exciting. And Roll Chains, the, the initial product that we're working with is sort of an effort to offer a different set of trade-offs in the modular ecosystem. One where you still have a validator set, you have that ability to decentralize and potentially scale out to a full POS set, different sorts of POA, different forms of security, whether it's adding Celestia to existing chains or using Celestia to add additional security to POA chains, using things like Ethos and Restaked ETH. Um, I think that there's a lot of options there. And with World Chains, we wanted to add another option to that. And I think the other thing that we're trying to do with World Chains is make it as easy as possible for folks who are coming into the ecosystem to be able to launch a new chain, whether it's on Rollkit or shared security with the hub or Celestia or one of the many excellent options. But I think right now there's no easy way for be beginners to approach the stack. There's, you know, you look, there's many different forks of the SDK, there's forks of Tendermint. It's very confusing when folks want to come in and try to build. And if you want to integrate all of the latest features, you end up spending a lot of time learning about Go dependency hell and um, <laughs> how where all these different repos are, and there's a ton of them. So we're trying to make that as easy as possible for developers and help build a way to sell services and software through that stack. And that's kind of what we're working on with Roll Chains. Yeah, I want to unpack that, but I just want to say like this Linux analogy, I think is really on point. And you know, I, I use this analogy a yeah. lot to describe um, how uh, Cosmos like is uh, is building this stack that enables modularity and um, that, you know, it, but but I, th I think for people that look at Cosmos from the outside, like there's there's a few things that are confusing. One is the this this kind of dependency on the Cosmos Hub, or at least this perceived dis dependency on the Cosmos Hub. Which you know, for people inside Cosmos, I think we understand that that's not the case. But for people outside of Cosmos, I think they they associate Cosmos with the Hub, and that somehow like the Hub manages all of this, or is somehow like orchestrating all the Cosmos chains. And then the other thing is the the app chain thesis that Cosmos pushed like pretty aggressively for uh, for a long time that was kind of a precursor to to, to modularity and was necessary in, in order to achieve modularity but I think people still associate Cosmos to, to sort of you know these highly vertically integrated app chains with a validator set and like the Cosmos SDK and perhaps Cosmosm and like IBC and so breaking apart those misconceptions outside of the space, right? When talking with, you know, 
typically when we talk to investors or when we talk to people in Ethereum that are not familiar with Cosmos is a challenge. How do you how do you uh, navigate that when speaking with people outside the space that might say like, oh, yeah, well, Adam's not doing very well. So then like, you know, Adam hasn't pumped recently. So yeah. maybe like Cosmos is not doing very well. Yeah, you know, it's I think that now with the launch of Celestia and DYTX and many of the other exciting projects coming this year, also with the rise of say and injective within the ecosystem, I think it's now much more of a multipolar ecosystem than in the past. And the Cosmos thesis has never been about the Cosmos hub as a single instantiation of this idea, and that was going to be the end of history. It's always been about this world in which there's hundreds, if not thousands, if not tens of thousands, if not millions of chains. And I think, you know, we saw Peng talk about millions of chains back in 2019. <laughs> so, like, this idea has been around, like, I see Nick white talking about millions of roll-ups and i tend to agree you know i think that there's going to be many of these verified state machines that have all kinds of different properties and the key there is the interoperability and i think you know there's an increasing realization throughout the crypto ecosystem broadly that ibc has effectively solved this bridging problem and that there's you know the a lot of the things that people would knock about the protocol like the call and response nature or some of the things that people think are overly complex has actually led to something that is very strong and extensible and able to provide first-class user experiences and cross-chain composability in a way that other protocols have just been unable to bring. And, and, you know, we see this over and over again. And, you know, I think that when I think about the Cosmos, I think about the broader IBC ecosystem. And in that broader IBC ecosystem, there's many things that have pumped, that are pumping, there's active communities there, and there's a lot of excitement, especially from the builder community. And, you know, that that is what has me excited. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, I think um, I think Cosmos is is kind of having a moment and we're, we're starting to see, you know, so that that the interest for Cosmos really, I mean, look, you were at East Denver, we, we had a brief bump yeah. in there, but like East Denver was all about modularity. And, you know, all, nearly every event that I went to, whether a Cosmos event or not, were, was talking about modularity. And there were these sort of subtones around like Cosmos and Celestia at nearly every event. So it really feels different from last year where, you know, most of the conversations were around like e ETH rollups and EVM rollups. There's really this kind of shift and convergence. And actually, we hosted an event um, on one convergence. of the there with... Love the name. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I, I don't think you were there, but um, I, I missed. I, I was out of town by that time, but yeah, yeah. No, no worries, but um, but basically, you know, we 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 wanted to address this idea of convergence, and this is something I wanted to run by you too. So there was this. Um, you know, people can watch the panel. It's it's up on the on the Nebula Summit um, uh, YouTube channel. There, you know, there was this idea around um, uh, this, this question of convergence and also alignment. So when, when people say things are, are ETH aligned or Bitcoin aligned, but specifically, I think when people talk about ETH alignment, there's this um, this assumption that, you know, it, ETH alignment is whatever accrues value to, to the Ether token, right? To, to, to Ether the token. Whereas with Cosmos alignment, it's not so clear. Like Cosmos alignment doesn't necessarily, I think, mean alignment with Atom or accruing value to the hub. Not, that might be hub alignment. But, you know, Yelena had a really good take on it and her, and her take was that cosmos alignment is technological alignment it's specifically ibc alignment and i thought that was that that really rang true to me and i wonder if you know if you sort of see it in a similar way or if there's some other nuance here that we're missing yeah and i, I well i mean i think one thing i would say about alignment is i don't like it <laughs> um, <laughs> You know, I think, yeah, I guess what I would say about alignment is that each of the major ecosystems kind of have a dominant philosophy. And the way that I view alignment is how closely different projects hew to a dominant philosophy as shown by their actions, yeah, as well as through the connections that those folks have with older community members, frankly, is really what it is. And, you know, I think that a lot of people, like, I have a venture fund, I've been working on Cosmos for a very long time. I, I see a lot of people seek me out and say like, hey, like, can you talk to, say nice things about my project or whatever it is? And they're like looking for Cosmos alignment. 
and they yeah. look to get you know the the sort of like cosmos ogs to all say the same thing you know this is like in in ethereum it's the same thing you know you're looking for justin drake and vitalik and, and that whole crew to you know push your push your project and this is an inherently uninclusive phenomenon it is exclusive and for a industry and a community as crypto as a whole that needs to grow or die i don't think this alignment narrative is particularly healthy in the long term for any projects pushing it and i think that the only way that we find product market fit as an industry is by questioning <laughs> all of our sacred cows all the time. And, you know, this is a very cosmos thing to say, but I do feel it strongly. And I think that, you know, the best thing that you can do to be modular aligned is to go build your own modular system. And, you know, folks will see that. So, yeah, I, I have th this overall meta around alignment, I think is at risk of shutting out a lot of good ideas and, being very unwelcoming to newcomers into the ecosystem. Yeah, I, I, that, I think it's a good take. Uh, Karthik from Ethos had a, a different take, which was that alignment uh, was relevant in the bear market, but in the bull market, like alignment just gets thrown out the window because, you know, there are incentives everywhere and like people move their capital wherever their capital can be better, best utilized uh, for, for the best returns. And so like, uh, the way I put it was that alignment is a bear market coping, a bear market coping mechanism. Um, yeah, I think I, I mostly align with like Yelena's uh, point of view here, which is that you know being aligned with Cosmos is being aligned with tech. I I like that because it it implies it doesn't imply that there are less implications of the sacred cows, right? Like guys, uh, I think the sacred cows are really the tokens or your bags. And, and, um, and if you don't necessarily, some of them are bags. also religious ideas about how blockchains work too. Yeah, that's true. And I think that that is like, those are the more dangerous ones, you know, tokens, but, but those, like but those are very often, understandable. Those are often underpinned by token values, right? Yeah. Often. Yeah. The Ethereum blockchain is always the, the example that I go to here, but, um, this idea that there will be one state machine that everything rolls down into and that we must imbue that state machine with certain properties and that those ideas are embodied by certain pieces of software or certain standards efforts. Like that's really deeply entrenched in that ecosystem and has yeah. led to, frankly, I think a lot of like questionable technical decisions. Yeah. Yeah. Perhaps. Um, okay, cool. Well, let's, let's talk about role chains. What the yeah. heck is a role chain? Um, a role chain is a chain that posts data to Celestia, but it's, yeah, so that's, you know, at the core of it, I think that's like this, uh, this idea that we've been working on and it's a Cosmos SDK chain and all it does is post the block data to Celestia. So, uh, there's a number of reasons chains might want to do this, uh, Celestia, there's a lot of sort of shared analytics services and other sort of indexing pieces that will index Celestia data. And that is a shared service that's offered. There's interoperability benefits. Once the Celestia data availability sampling is incorporated into the IBC light clients, it will add quite a bit of additional security to cross-chain transfers. Um, so making already the most secure system, taking it and future-proofing it. Um, it moves from an honest majority assumption to a one of n. Uh, honesty assumption, which is like a huge step up in the security of, of IBC. So those pieces, as well as any other future advancements that allow for better interoperability between projects using that data availability sampling layer. Okay. There's a lot to unpack there. So let's maybe take a, take a broad view here and think about, okay, so why would it change? Let's say you're, you're a new uh, you're building a new application, you're a developer, or perhaps even an existing application, and you're considering a, a role chain, what what are the, 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 the considerations that one would have to make in order to pick a role chain over the vanilla way of launching a chain, which is like go out, like get get some validators to want to run your, your client and validate your chain and like pay them a bunch of money to do that by inflation. Um, how would you sort of yeah. make that, that choice? 
I think, you know, it, the way we launched Noble is instructive. You know, Noble was not, we're not paying validators with inflation. There's a POA right. set and we've got a different model for paying validators. And I think that this is a big motivation behind role chains is those sorts of small POA sets to help launch your project, to get out there and to look for product market fit are vastly cheaper, don't require projects to launch a token, it, or much more nimble from an upgradability perspective. And it also doesn't forestall you from moving to full proof of stake. And in fact, that's an easy network upgrade with a very trodden path. That's kind of what we're seeing is the reason pro projects want roll-ups is because of that lowered barrier to entry. And I think that we can offer that same low barrier to entry with a standard Cosmos chain and also offer the ability to scale and decentralize more baked into the software rather than rather than having to build that out all right so let, let's take noble as an example there was an announcement made recently that noble will uh use roll chains um yeah now it's like just going back to, to noble so noble as you said is a proof of authority chain so currently there are something like 50 uh validators that are essentially have been chosen to validate the chain they're they're not being paid um, staking rewards for doing that and and they're like a sort of chosen set now when noble onboards role chain what's that going to look like and how will that augment the security of the chain yeah so when you're a proof of authority set what you worry about is those proof of authority validators being malicious and one thing you can do to help guard against that is to post that data to a data availability layer to provide a third-party audit log as well as the ability for network participants to restart the chain from a certain checkpoint in the event that those validators do decide to steal the money. So this adds additional security to the system and helps provide an independent audit log. And I think that's like, that's a really nice feature for folks. And I, I think that that's a huge reason. Another reason is, uh, as we mentioned, that data availability layer offers a lot of potential for interop and being on there and posting your data enables you to take advantage of those interop features as soon as they come live. So as there's all this perfusion of rollups, obviously Noble wants Noble USDC on all of those rollups and posting to the same data availability layer is a great way to help ensure that Noble will be top of mind when it comes to uh, liquidity expansion on those rollups. Okay, I want to unpack this uh, interoperability aspect, but just one one more um, part on the security. Um, so, would roll chains be useful for a chain that um, has an open validator set, like I don't know, like Osmosis, for example, or uh, or Stargaze, where it's not a proof of authority chain, or is this primarily like a benefit for proof of authority for proof of authority chains where you have a smaller validator set with no real, say, economic incentive, like slashing incentive? Uh, and you want to augment that security by adding a third party auditing. Yes. Yeah, that, that's basically it. And, and I think, you know, what if you go look at Spawn, which is our tool to help make launching these things really easy, you'll see that the proof of authority module comes standard in there. And we think that this is the right way to go launch Cosmos chains today. Um, the last market cycle showed the downsides of this really inflation heavy model that was predominant in Cosmos for a long time. And proof of authority is a way to get started, get a lot of the benefits of having the FT consensus, whether it's secure cross-chain communication, using a light client, whether it is uh, fault tolerance, like in a roll-up, you've only got one node that effectively sort of like runs the whole network. And if that node goes down, you have downtime on the network. And we've seen this over and over again in L2s. With a full consensus cluster, you can tolerate downtime from many nodes and the network is much more stable and likely to sort of continue making progress. So um, there's a number of benefits to having a small consensus set and the cost is relatively low. And especially the cost is low if you strip out that inflationary token benefit um, that validators get and just pay validators for running the software or, you know, a lot of validators will run chains in the hopes of being a part of that chain in the future and depending on what your project is attracting validators is like one of the easiest ways one of the easiest parts of launching a chain and i think that this is a huge misunderstanding from folks outside the ecosystem 
Because people are like, oh, why would you launch a Cosmos chain? It's really hard to find validators. It's like, no, the hardest parts of launching a project are making sure your front end and your user experience is like top notch. Making sure you have users doing an airdrop, doing incentivized test nets, getting your token distribution right, raising money. Like all of those parts are way harder than finding validators. And they still exist in that rollup ecosystem as well. And, you know, what we have built in Cosmos is this fantastic stable of really great independent validator operators. And all of those folks are always looking for new chains. Yeah, there's no shortage of validators in Cosmos and um, and certainly no shortage of like real professional ones. I think there's like hundreds of, of companies that are, you know, we could consider professional validators or like semi-professional validators. Uh, let's let's zoom in in um, to this IBC um, and interoperability aspect. Uh, can you unpack how this will improve the uh, security of IBC? Yeah. So right now, the Cosmos, the, the Tendermint light client, relies on an honest majority assumption, and basically what that means is it relies on two thirds of the validators on your counterparty chain to be interested in moving the chain forward. And one third of validators in the other chain can actually halt progress and make it so that IBC packets can't move forward. And in practice, we don't really see this happen, but it is a theoretical attack against the system. And with larger stakes at stake, we're more likely to see these types of attacks. Adding the data availability sampling into that tender mint light client takes that trust assumption from an honest majority to what's called one of n so as long as a single one of the validators does the right thing then the packets will continue to flow and that light client can continue to make progress and these are the types of things that are really really important as these systems scale to continue to increase the security with these advances in cryptography and system design and th that's what celestia is it's a fundamental advance in cryptography and system design and this modular thing that we're all working on right now is people trying to figure out how to incorporate that fundamental advance into the systems that we built and design and this interoperability property is like one of the key benefits that it that it seems able to provide now will, will this benefit only chains that incorporate the role chain module and um, or or other chains as well, like that are part of, that are like connected to IBC to those chains? Like what is the, the distance from a role chain app um, in order to benefit from the security, if that makes sense? Uh, yeah. Yeah, so it's, I mean, the IBC Go team is working on adding data availability sampling to the Tenderbit like client right now. I think they're anticipating okay, yeah. shipping that feature in Q3, I think was the current estimate last time I checked. The Rollkit team is pushing this strongly as well, because right now Rollkit rollups only have uh, very weak security with using IBC. Um, so there's a strong push to get this out there. We'll see that live sometime this year, hopefully. Okay, and so and so the idea here is that in the future, any Cosmo chain, whether it's using role chains or not, like could post data availability to like the tenement like client would post data availability to Celestia in order to augment the security of IBC, but also um, of the validator set, like more generally. Yeah, I mean, there's there's nothing stopping anyone from doing that. You know, if if this is the case, if all Cosmos chain, let's say like, you know, a vast majority of Cosmos chains are posting data to Celestia. What what role does Celestia then play in improving like the general sort of fungibility and interoperability of tokens within like this ecosystem? Does that does that come into play at all? Or are we still just using IBC then uh, to move tokens around? I think you know, this is, IBC is able to structurally incorporate all of these system design and cryptography advances underneath this client abstraction that we have. And IBC is really just a protocol for the communication. It doesn't say anything about what authentication mechanisms people use, and it doesn't say anything about what applications are traveling on top of it. And I think this is one of the most broadly misunderstood parts of IBC, the protocol, 
yeah. is the strength of it is the transport layer. It's not necessarily the application layer, but the application layer can and will improve, and there's already a rich application ecosystem. It's not necessarily the verification layer, even though it's still the best verification layer in the world, and it is improving through folks like Union and Polymer and Composable and all of the different folks pushing Avalanche, uh, the Avalanche Project landslide, um, through all of the folks pushing forward the state of the art in terms of IBC verification. It's that standard transport layer that serves all of the use cases out there that is the strength. And the more and more chains and state machines and smart contracts that are addressable through that transport layer, the stronger and stronger the protocol becomes. And I think that this is the key to understanding the network effects of IBC. So role chains is essentially a Cosmos SDK module, right? So any, any yes. Cosmos SDK chain can incorporate this module and choose to post data to Celestia. Um, and, and perhaps even, you know, consider, uh, rethinking its entire economic model by, uh, reducing the inflation of the token, reducing the number of validators. I mean, do you think that this is something chains will do? Like, do you, you know, in, in a year from now, are we going to see like most Cosmos chains have something like 10, 20 validators instead of 120 and like drastically reducing their inflation and potentially like even being profitable? <laughs> I think that this is, this is the world I'd like to move into. And we're in talks with a number of Cosmos chains to like help them do this. But I, I think that this is obviously where we need to move. Spending as much as we are on inflation right now is completely unsustainable. And this is at least one path to help lower that in the very, very short term. Right. That's, that's super interesting. I mean, to think about sort of the and structural Profitability chains. is a huge piece of it too. Yeah. Like yeah. we all got to make money. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Yeah. And I think like for Cosmos chains in the bull that's market, a, it was, sorry. Yeah. I was going to say that's a, that's a dangerous bear market thought that, that people actually need to make money. So I, I'm sorry for introducing the bear market thoughts here, but. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, th I think like in, in, a, in a bull market, you know, you can inflate your token as, as much as you want. And as long as, as long as the, the, everything is pumping, that's going to work. But as soon as um, everything comes back down again, it becomes a lot harder. And I think a lot of chains uh, in Cosmos specifically, you know, s experience this pain and, and are struggling to recover. Um, so yeah, I mean, if if this, I think I think there needs to be like a clear path and a, um, a clear kind of model for maybe restructuring tokenomics and and restructuring the validator set in a way that makes sense and that um, doesn't like also doesn't uh, leave the community and token holders um, out on the street. Yeah, but I yeah. mean, I think that you know broadly, like you look at ETH two. And there's quite a bit of validator concentration in terms of stake weight and voting power. And the practical number of entity, like the Nakamoto coefficient, there's many discussions around this, but it's not super high. And I mean, even for Solana, it's on the order of like 30, I think. So this idea that we need hundreds of thousands of validators, I think is farcical on its face. And the key is stake decentralization and that's a distribution problem that has a number of different solutions none of which include running more nodes so the benefits to large validator sets are very diminishing and i think for 99 percent of projects that aren't looking to have global nation state censorship resistance which frankly is like a very very high bar that i think even most large chains struggle to meet to have that property like if you just want resilience against north korea for example you probably only need a nakamoto coefficient of like five <laughs> you only need a nakamoto coefficient of five you need like 15 validators which is way fewer than folks are running now and i i think that that is that's an inefficiency that the market can and will correct yeah i wonder about that right because I think there is a meme of decentralization that is more important than the actual practical, um, the actual practical benefits of decentralization. And it is a, I think the meme of decentralization helps also to justify why we need blockchains and like why blockchains are important. And I think, you know, when you were talking earlier about 
sort of technological architecture design choices and and sort of religious ideas behind that. I think I think there is value in this idea of decentralization. I mean, this is why Bitcoin exists. This is why like the entire space is here. And I think we shouldn't forget that, right? Like as as long as we keep abstracting away decentralization, you know, systems get more fragile also and are more prone perhaps to, you know, to attack and in in ways that like can't necessarily foresee or um, weren't intended on. So I, I, I'm, I'm always cautious to, you know, say, okay, yeah. like, you know, decentral, we only need like a Nakamoto consensus uh, coefficient of this much, right? Like, you know, these systems exist for a reason. If, and if we're going to be powering and sort of perhaps like securing trillions and trillions of like t tens of trillions of dollars in assets, and uh, it all comes down to like a few nodes, then I, I think that that sort of puts into question the, the utility of all this. You know, I think that what happened with Blast is a great real world example of this that's happened in the last few days. You know, Cosmos folks looked at Blast and they were like, ugh, ugh. And it, a bunch of DJs looked at Blast and were like, ah, 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 ah. Well, let's go ape this. And, you know, it's sad but predictable watching things like this happen. And when you use weak security models, p attackers will exploit them. And I think that this is why things like future proofing IBC by adding data availability sampling and ensuring that there's these much more secure variants of what we have now that's already incredibly secure. You know, if you look at the amount of bridge hacks, of bridge hacks, zero dollars of it are IBC hacks. And we are still the largest bridge by volume and have been for years. And like, you know, this just points to the difference in the Cosmos community versus other communities. And I think that what we're building, we're building for the future. We're building for, you know, truly adversarial environments. And whereas I think that there's a lot of people who are shipping these centralized systems that are just building for right now and building for what users want immediately. And we're seeing that reflected in the amount of exploits in those systems. Yeah, I mean, I think there is value in building things in a sort of progressive way also, you know, and, and I think Noble's a good yeah. example of this and, and chains that are considering proof of authority and then like further decentralization in the future, I think uh, is, is a right approach. Uh, but that the goal should always be, you know, sort of future proofing and and building in this adversarial model, like that should always be top of mind. Does role chains also, or will it also support other DA layers like Avail or, you know, Eigen DA, or is, is there any utility yeah. in adding additional DA layers as well? In the future, you know, our business model is going to revolve around selling software and services to folks running the Cosmos stack and providing utility to those users. So if those users find utility in other DA layers, like we'll try to offer that, I think you know, we'll probably offer outputs to build a Cosmos app that works with partial set security or things like Saga or things like Ethos. So we're agnostic to the underlying layers and very interested in helping enable architectures that people want and enable the best apps to be built. And, you know, this is, if you look at every era of software, value is accrued to the applications. And I think that there's been a lot of effort investing and building in protocols, but not enough effort building applications. And I think this was one of the big, you're talking about ETH Denver earlier. This is one of the big topics throughout ETH Denver is people are like, where's the apps, man? It's like yep. everyone's got their own shared sequencer based roll up thing and like, where are the apps? And people might say that about roll chains too, but what we're doing is we're making the longest lived most successful application platform, easier to use for developers and abstracting a lot of the complexity from this excellent infrastructure that's being built through this like huge investment in that infrastructure and trying to surface that to app builders. And we think that's incredibly valuable. So one slightly unrelated question here, but just to, you know, dispel any confusion here, what is the what is the difference between role chains and role apps, like the dimension role apps? Uh, so dimension role apps, like we'll, we'll work to add a spawn output for dimension role apps. Um, dimension role apps are a lot like uh, role kit, 
they break apart the the different pieces of consensus and it's just an execution environment that posts data to Celestia and relies on the Dimension Hub for IBC settlement. Um, so yeah, it, it's just a, a different set of trade-offs in that mar modular architecture. And what are the what are the trade-offs like as a developer? You know, picking either roll apps or roll chain. I think you know personally, and you know what we're we're endeavoring to build tooling that does not encode these values. Like I don't care. Like I have my own values about crypto. I build software that tries to help people express those, but we also build software that helps people build whatever they want. And like, you know, build whatever is this motto for Celestia. I firmly believe in that. People should be able to build whatever. And I think with a lot of these roll-up frameworks, and this is not just Dimension, but you know, every roll-up framework out there, you're building this execution environment. And what we've seen over and over again, and I think DYDX is the poster child for this, but there's a number of other examples of this, when an application reaches a certain scale, they inherently want their own state machine for a wide variety of reasons. And the transition from that roll-up world to running your own state machine, i.e. your own chain, that's a very untrodden path. No applications have really done that yet. Whereas building from a small validator set first and then being able to expand it, people have done that over and over again. And there's a great set of tooling to do that. So there's this very broad and very uh, easy path to decentralize your application. It's not like a progressive decentralization, we'll figure it out later. It's like, hey, there's a very easy path to do this. It's a quick software upgrade and then we're good to go. Um, people who have built and maintained systems understand the benefits of easy migrations. And this is what we offer in a lot of ways. Okay, cool. And we mentioned ethos a couple times. Um, yeah, uh, ethos is is a lot of people are talking about ethos right now. It's still kind of stealth. There's been little said about it. I think generally there's an understanding of um, what ethos enables. But yeah, could you describe like your your work with the ethos project and how it fits into you know this role chain architecture? <sighs> Yeah, so Strange Love um, started working with Ethos last fall. We helped build out some initial versions of their mesh security application. This idea of using restate ETH to secure rollups or other application systems, like we think that's a great benefit. And there's a lot of people in Ethereum who want to invest more and work more with Cosmos. We should make it easy. We should make it as easy as possible for them to do that, and that's what Ethos does. So, um, you know, I think that it's a good mix and match with things like data availability that help offer additional security. And when you're thinking about small POA chains, having numerous different sources of security is hugely beneficial and can help provide a very strong system for end users. And ethos is going to be a big part of that. This is one point that I think uh, I'm, I'm not super clear on yet. And is like, how does ethos enable application developers or projects in Ethereum get closer to Cosmos? I mean, what is the practical, how, how does that practically work? And um, from the perspective of like having restate ETH securing a Cosmos chain? Yeah, so there's a, an eigenlayer AVS, which are additionally validated services. These are services that Ethereum validators run that are a part of eigenlayer. And that AVS can then provide those tokens, that AVS is effectively a Cosmos chain. <laughs> so like, that's where the interoperability layer is. There's a Cosmos chain there. That AVS is the ethos chain. And any ETH that's restaked in that AVS then becomes available to the application within that AVS. And then that application, which is ethos, can kind of do with it what it wants. And what it wants to do is sell it to Cosmos chains in return for yield. And that's yeah. how that works. Okay, got it. And how does IBC come into play here? I mean, as a Cosmos chain, it just supports IBC out of the box. And does, you know, does Ethos also then facilitate interoperability with um, Ethereum chains or EVM chains? Uh, or do you need something like Union or Polymer? Um, or maybe yeah, Composable you'll need, you'll need something like Union or Polymer to do that. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. So, so we're, we're separating here the security from the interoperability. Those are two, those remain two separate things. And 
running ethos yeah. on eigenlayer with restake ETH doesn't in, doesn't in any way improve you know the prospects of interoperability with EVM chains. Not really, no, but it does improve social interoperability with the ETH holder set and that long discussion around alignment earlier. I think that, you know, despite my feelings about it, um, I think that there's many people who will want alignment and that's not necessarily a bad thing and we can and should provide that to them if they want it. Right. Do, do you think that ethos users or like ethos developers will come mostly from the Cosmos side or do you think from the Ethereum side trying to you sort of integrate or get closer to Cosmos, or do you think it'll come from both? Ethereum has this large token and this huge capital base to drive alignment. Cosmos does not have that. So we don't really have people showing up in Cosmos, like looking to be more Cosmos aligned. The reason people show up in Cosmos is because they have an application that they want to build and they can't do it any other way. So with that framing, I think we're likely to see a lot more Ethereum folks. And this is what I've seen, you know, the ethos team is when I first chatted with them, they're like, we're Ethereum maxis. Like we don't really understand a lot of the Cosmos stuff. Can you help us understand it? Can you help us learn to work with it? And I think that, you know, the duality team is another team that way. That's that way. The neutron team, there are many teams in Cosmos from the sort of last set of cycles that have moved from Ethereum over into this world. And then, you know, what we're seeing is like some of that slowing back into Ethereum. And I think that that sort of estuary, if you can call it that, where there's like the sea and the, the, the river meeting, like, and the, it's this mix of salt and brackish water almost, like that space will increase. And there's going to be more and more interchange between the two ecosystems. But what Ethereum has is capital and what Cosmos has is technology and better system design. And I think that many folks, we talked a lot about sort of religious ideas behind blockchains and like how some people want hundreds of thousands of validators and the Ethereum system has been designed to do that. There's a lot of people from Ethereum who come over to Cosmos and they say, man, this consensus system we designed for mainnet Ethereum is massive overkill. And like this consensus system that you guys have is battle tested and proven. And there's a lot of great uses for that. And they end up building systems. And I think that that's, that's what we're going to see more and more. So I just did an episode with um, with Garvit of uh, Electron Labs, and they're building. Oh, um, powerful Garvit! How's he doing? He's good. So I think we kind of touched on this idea that Ethereum will, uh, in the future, like Ethereum will just be this massive chain that is just some, kind of like proving uh, or validating zk proofs, right? The, like no transactions will happen on chain; it will just be like validating zk proofs and sort of these super proofs. Um, thanks to its like large economic security set and that applications will be built, you know, using things like, like the Cosmos SDK or like the move VM or other form, other VMs. Um, do you see that as like a long-term future for Ethereum as well? Or are there like other nuances here that you think might come into play? Yeah. I mean, I think that the best technology that serves developers, application developers, the best is likely to win. And, you know, you're talking about all these virtual machine environments. What we have in the Cosmos SDK is a framework where you kind of plug in virtual machines on the top and you plug in consensus or, you know, data availability on the bottom. And this provides a shim that allows application developers to really build whatever. And I see that as the dominant structure, like for building applications moving forward. And if it's not the Cosmos SDK, something else that offers something very similar is likely to win. So um, yeah, uh, that is that is kind of what I see moving forward. Very cool. A continuing um, fusion of the two stacks, basically. Yeah, a, a huge delta of brackish water at the estuary between the river of, of Cosmos yeah. and, the, and the sea of Ethereum. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The convergence delta. Um, cool. Yeah. Well, I've got like lots of other kind of rapid fire questions here. Um, them. Let's do it. Move VM movement. Yeah. What are your thoughts? I think Rushi's fantastic. I think there's a lot of confusion around move. And, you know, I, I think there's a number of reasons for that. And at the core of it is this sort of like spat between Sui and Aptos. And people are like, this isn't the true move. You're not using the true move. But I think that, you know, look, it religions. is a it, religions and it is a virtual machine designed with crypto native concepts around tokens and accounts. 
that is built with safety in mind. And this, again, this blast hack underlies how important smart contract safety is. And like, you know, that was due to a hiring pipeline thing, but there's numerous other examples of this and the EVM is just not very secure. So I do think that there's a strong likelihood that the EVM is not the end state and that we end up seeing the growth of other ecosystems. It may be Cosmosm, it may be Move. So love what Rushi is doing and pushing a sort of more agnostic version of Move that works across a number of different architectures. I think smart contract like verifiability is extremely important and they have uh, sort of like built in formal verification systems within Move. These are the types of forward looking features I, I see as really important to application developers. How complementary do you think the Move VM is, or particularly like movement to the Cosmos SDK and Cosmwasm? I mean, I guess like it kind of competes with Cosmwasm on the uh, application side, but you know, conceivably you could build an application that's IBC compatible that uses Move. Um, this right, is what I mean, Anisha is yeah. doing. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, I think that, you know, the movement, movement, I think is a slightly different architecture. I don't think they're building on top of the Cosmos SDK, but when we're talking about the SDK is this sort of like uh, circuit board layer where you're like plugging in hardware on the bottom and you're, you've got peripherals coming in on the top in the VMs, like the move VM is just another VM you plug in and it can and should be interoperable with the other VMs um, and IBC. This is exactly what Initia says they're going to offer. We'll, we'll see when that comes out. But, you know, what we should do is, is like infrastructure builders is be agnostic to developer choices on top. And what we see in Web2 is that the developer tools that meet developers where they are and speak to the largest number of developers in terms of language communities and tooling communities and whatever it is, those are the those are the open source applications that end up winning. And like this is what we need to do in Cosmos and the move community is growing. We can and should have a move environment that enables people to program in our world. All right. Other question. Evmos, will it recover? I think the I think last time you were on here, we were also talking about Evmos, but uh, oh yeah, yeah. Um, I, I don't have a viewpoint on that. I do know Fetty's a fantastic founder. I know that team is stuck through a rough bear market. I think that the new EVM that they've been working on is extremely interesting. Uh, the Ripple folks have adopted that, and there's I think more adoption on the horizon for the the Ethermint stack that they've built. I see. More And one note on that is it's closed source right now, or not closed source, it's uh, business source licensed um, and open source. Uh, and I see more and more application teams kind of going down that route, like Skip is doing. And one of the things that we're hoping to enable at Roll Chains is to enable folks like that to sell much more easily to users and to help build out that model around selling open source software and help normalize that. Because... You know, the method that we have of paying for development right now is this ICO in 2017 has paid for a lot of the Cosmos development. Like, that's not sustainable. We need a different model. And, like, I think the ethmos folks are pointing towards that right now. Yeah. Interoperability, Pol Polymer and Union. Um, what do you, what do you, what do you make of what they're building? And uh, when, when do you think we'll see some, some actual utility come out of these projects? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, Union's live on testnet. You can go transfer stuff between EVMs and Cosmos environments today. Um, they have followed up all of their announcements with concrete integrations with various testnets. I think that they're currently planning on an early Q3, maybe late Q2 launch. Um, I think that that's likely to hold. Polymer released some more marketing around their white paper today. I think they've done a fantastic job of growing awareness for IBC within the Ethereum community and the broader crypto community. It's been kind of short on details so far, so we'll see what they come out with. I'm an investor and advisor on both of those teams. Yeah. Um, and yeah, Skip. We had Magmar on the podcast a couple of weeks ago. Mag's, they're, Mag's they're, fantastic. They're crushing it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I love the Skip team. You know, the, the philosophy that I'm on here talking about um, around being agnostic to some of these religious decisions 
and shipping what people need and are demanding. Um, I think that there's few teams that embody that more than the skip team. They are, they are the heroes we, we need. <laughs> They're doing yeah, great. They're doing very, great very yeah. unsung and un, 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 uh, uncelebrated heroes. Um, yeah. Like. Yeah. And I mean, They're mostly quiet. I think cause they don't have a token. But, uh, you know, yeah. they're building such important tech. Yeah, they're quiet. They keep their heads down and they ship. And, yeah. you know, what else can you ask from people? Yeah, absolutely. Cool. Uh, well, yeah, I guess before we wrap up, like, what are you most excited about right now? Like, what keeps you, uh, what keeps you excited about Cosmos right now? You know, I think that what I have always tried to do is solve what I view as the hardest problems facing the ecosystem, whether it was shipping the hub, growing SDK uh, usage, shipping IBC, growing IBC usage. I think the biggest problem facing the ecosystem right now is fragmentation, especially from a developer user experience standpoint and growth in application development. And I think that that's what we're trying to tackle at World Chains. And what we endeavor to do is cut through the noise and provide the easiest and quickest way to get started. And that is exciting for me. I love it. Excellent. Jack, thanks for coming on the podcast once again. Actually, I was looking, uh, the last time you yeah. were on was, was just two years ago. Like next week will be two years. So you've got to come on more often. 